My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Brandon Burda, Masters of Science student with the University of Regina, will be talking about sharp-tailed grouse, tools for managing in a changing landscape. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Join us on December 19th at noon for a presentation about the Manitoba Burrowing Owl Recovery Program by Alexandra Froessi. And save the date, January 28th at noon will be a webinar presentation about loggerhead shrikes by Amy Shabbat of Shrike Watch Canada. To register or find out more about these presentations, please visit the PCAP website. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by Trans Canada Corporation, Canada North Environmental Services, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Eco-Friendly SASC, Information Services Corporation, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the University of Regina. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. Now a bit about our presenter. Brandon Berta is a current master's student at the University of Regina, studying sharp-tailed grouse and their lacking habit, habits. Originally from Ontario, Brandon completed his undergraduate degree at Carleton University, studying both biology as well as earth sciences, after which he also completed Algonquin College's Outdoor Adventure Naturalist Program. When not working on his master's, he can be found camera in hand exploring Saskatchewan. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Brandon. All right. And there we go. Is it showing for you guys? Um, not yet. Not yet. Oh, um, maybe it could be just me. Oh, there we go. Perfect. You got it. Yes, we can, I can see it there. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, having me. And uh, my name again is Brandon Berta. And today I wanna to talk to you about my research on sharp-tailed grouse, uh, probably one of the more interesting birds that we have here in the province, definitely uh, quickly becoming one of my favorites in the world. Uh, and before we start uh, kind of going into the research, I do wanna go over a bit on what on earth a sharp-tailed grouse even is. So in the province, uh, we actually have six different type of grouse. Uh, here we have uh, some of the pictures. Uh, I have uh, very smart, like chopped off their tails, so you can't necessarily tell which one is the sharp tail right off the bat, unless you were sneaky and looked at the first picture. Uh, on our left, though, we have our two ptarmigans. We have a rock and willow ptarmigan. Uh, they are found more in the far north. Uh, they're more of our boreal kind of tundra species. Uh, next, we have our spruce and ruffed grouse. These are very much uh, found up in the forests. And on the right, we have our sharp tail and sage grouse, more grassland species, uh, and both very uh, prolific dancers, as we will find out. And so sharp tail grouse are a very interesting bird. They're found uh, all across North America. Uh, most people think of them as purely a uh, grasslands bird. Uh, but they can actually be found all the way up into Alaska, uh, down to about Colorado, and all the way over into uh, Quebec. And there even is a small population that was relocated into Prince Edward Island. And uh, while they are only a small population, they are still there holding on. And so sharp-tailed grouse, uh, they get their names obviously from their sharp tails, uh, as you can see in the picture there on the left. Uh, they use those tails as a lovely display when they're out kind of trying to attack mates. Uh, if you're not able to see their tails, though, another surefire way to know that you're looking at a sharp-tailed grouse is to look at their breasts. Uh, and what you'll see is very distinct Vs. And so you can kind of see that uh, on both pictures, but the one on the right kind of shows that a lot better. And kind of a neat thing that I find uh, about sharp-tailed grouse, just because of how uh, diverse of a landscape they cover, there's actually six different subspecies. 
good luck trying to find out uh, the differences between them. I've spent uh, a year trying to find any sort of really good documentation uh, as to how different they look. The only thing that I've really found is that the more northern boreal species are a little bit more brown and the grassland species are a little bit more silver. Uh, but we do have uh, three that are kind of more uh, likely to be found up in the boreal uh, forest. That is the Alaska in the northwest and the northern sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, and more grassland species, we have the plains sharp-tailed grouse, the prairie sharp-tailed grouse, and the Colombian sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, of them, they're all actually doing fairly well, except for the Colombian sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, it is actually endangered, and it's primarily found in the valleys of uh, BC, Washington, and Oregon, kind of in and around the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and the one that we have here in uh, Saskatchewan, at least in the greatest numbers, is actually the Plains sharp-tailed grouse. And so just kind of a quick map that shows where uh, we can find sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, you can see that they're found all over the place, and in Saskatchewan they're found practically everywhere, uh, which is pretty fitting because they are Saskatchewan's uh, provincial bird. But of course, sharp-tailed grouse, if they're known for one thing, that is their lex. And what a lek is, is it is a communal dancing ground where males will compete for the attention of females uh, for the purposes of mating. And so the males will all kind of gather together on a small hill or ridge, uh, and they'll all start dancing kind of early spring. Usually they'll start the dance uh, about an hour to about half an hour before sunrise, and they'll go to about two hours after sunrise. Uh, it makes for awesome pictures as you can kind of get the rising sun uh, casting a nice golden glow on them. And it's also just a really unique experience to kind of go out and find these guys dancing around. And so the leks are kind of fun. Uh, each male on that lek has its own individual territory that they'll try and uh, maintain. And the birds in the middle are actually the ones that are the ones to watch. Those are the guys uh, who will dance the hardest, they'll dance the longest, and they're the ones most likely to uh, attract a female. Uh, one kind of fun fact about leks is that uh, you can go out and you can find leks from like 10 males to 30 plus males. Uh, and in all these leks, only maybe one, two or three of those males will ever get to mate uh, in their lifetime. And those are the ones that kind of hold that uh, center slot. And so leks uh, are actually pretty important as far as the life history, as you can kind of gather. Uh, it's where all of them get together and the females come and get to pick their mates. Uh, and as such, they're kind of used as a management unit for sharp-tailed grouse, uh, typically kind of called a breeding complex. And within that complex, you have the lek and about uh, a two kilometer radius around that. Uh, the reason for that is that females, once they've mated, they'll probably go no more than about, uh, not getting audio on my end. Oh, are other people still able to hear me? I can hear you okay. Um, can everyone out there hear Brandon? There's one person who typed in that they couldn't. Um, I see someone else that says that you can, so I guess we'll keep going. And um, yeah, a few people are saying that you're coming in loud and clear. So um, there's one person there that seems to be having some trouble, so I'll just walk them through it. So. Um, okay, apologies. Yeah, thanks. Keep going on then, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so the females, they'll probably no longer, uh, they'll not go more than about uh, two kilometers away from a lek to nest, uh, typically no more than actually about a kilometer. And so uh, females, when they're looking for a nesting site, they'll look for tall grass and shrubs, which is kind of the opposite of what you expect on a lek itself, which is more short grasses for uh, visibility's sake. And so uh, how on earth then do you manage sharp-tailed grouse if you're using leks and things like that as a measuring tool? Well, in Saskatchewan, what we actually do is we look at their harvest rates. Uh, sharp-tailed grouse are a hunted bird. Uh, I believe the stat is that there was over 9,000 people registered to hunt them in 2016. Uh, and that number is kind of probably increasing. They are a very popular uh, hunted bird. And so the way that we can manage uh, sharp-tailed grouse uh, is by kind of changing around uh, daily bag limits, uh, the possession or season limits, or even changing when the season is. Uh, and kind of some exciting news for those who are interested in hunting sharp-tailed grouse, uh, the Upland Game Bird Management Program uh, plan actually just came out this week. Uh, and so it has all the new information that you need to know about uh, all your favorite Upland Game Birds. And so, uh, just as an example there, you can see how uh, we kind of look at 
uh, sharp-tailed grouse and what is used right now to kind of determine what uh, harvest strategy we're using. And so harvest rate uh, is uh, it's an average of how many birds each hunter that is registered uh, actually harvests. And so uh, taking a three-year average, if hunters are taking more than about 2.5, we're able to stay in a liberal or kind of a base uh, hunting strategy. So you're able to take a daily limit of three and a possession limit of six. Uh, if for some reason uh, the hunting uh, harvest ratio starts to drop, it means that there's not as many birds to be hunted anyway, and we will drop the uh, like the maximum daily bag limits and the possession limits just to allow for uh, the birds to have a better chance to kind of spring back. And so to better uh, inform these decisions, uh, there are some other things that we're hoping to gather. And this is kind of where uh, my title comes in. We're looking for tools that can help us manage these species. And so the first thing that we're very interested in is how on earth does weather affect the productivity between years? Uh, Sharp-tailed grouse are very hardy birds. They live here throughout the year. And so obviously uh, they can stand very high temperatures and very cold temperatures. Uh, but there's probably a few months uh, during every year that they're kind of susceptible to uh, changing temperatures and we're kind of curious, uh, you know, when that is and what those uh, particular like temperatures and precipitation uh, regimes might be that will actually affect them. Uh, and second, you need to know where on earth sharp-tailed grouse actually are and what their preferred habitats are. Uh, this way we're able to protect them and we're able to uh, kind of be more targeted in our efforts to kind of know where sharp-tailed grouse need to be protected. And so another kind of big question people have is, you know, why on earth do sharp-tailed grouse uh, need to be managed or why do they need to be studied? Well, they're economical. So like I said, a lot of people hunt them, but they are also a very uh, culturally important species. Uh, as I mentioned, they are the provincial bird of Saskatchewan. Uh, before Canada was even a thing, sharp-tailed grouse and other of uh, the prairie chickens uh, were very important to the First Nations people uh, as uh, not only a food source, but also inspiration for a lot of their dances. Uh, even today, there are uh, dances known as the chicken dance or the prairie chicken dance. Uh, which is a very important dance for uh, certain peoples and uh, it is something that uh, should be celebrated like these birds have an awesome dance and uh, this is just another way for us to kind of show how amazing these birds are and another thing is uh, as far as ecologically speaking their populations are in decline uh, this is due primarily due to habitat loss fragmentation and degradation uh, they are a grassland species and grasslands uh, are on the decline. And so being able to kind of look at sharp-tailed grouse and figure out where they need to be, uh, you can help to conserve grasslands better. Uh, and just some kind of sad, depressing facts for the day. Uh, there's only about 20 to 30% of all of the mixed and short grass prairies left in North America, uh, with only 1% of tall grass prairie remaining in North America. And so a lot of this only remains thanks to uh, ranching, and uh, kind of areas that aren't really that accessible to uh, being turning to cropland, uh, all of which is necessary, but it is something to think about that uh, a lot of this land is being converted away. And so being able to save uh, what's left is very beneficial for our, our native creatures. And so how on earth am I gonna be able to do all this? Well, it, field work is the key. And so this is my awesome crew that I had. Uh, smiling and joking around at like five in the morning. Uh, and so this last spring from about the last week of March to the end of May, uh, we went out looking for sharp-tailed grouse and we had a pretty awesome year. Uh, we were able to survey uh, 28 different areas. And so uh, the Ministry of Environment back in 1958 to about 2004 uh, actually did a whole bunch of lek surveys. And they were able to give me uh, all of the information and they had everything broken down to what we call a survey block so just basically an area so it could be a community pasture or just a large uh, section of land and we would drive around that looking for as many sharp tail grass legs as we could uh, and in total i was able to go through about 18 of those historical uh, survey blocks and i was able to add 10 more on uh, just by kind of driving around and finding new areas that sharp tail grass are and so in total uh, in those two months, we found uh, over 100 leks, uh, 112 to be precise, and of which we were able to count 87. Uh, it's kind of depressing sometimes that you can hear them about a kilometer away uh, because you'd get there and you would hear them like right over a hill. Uh, but without land permission, we couldn't go walking around trying to find out where it is. And so 
Uh, you get a pretty good idea where they are sometimes, but sometimes you have to kind of just note that they're there, but you just you can't see them. And so uh, just kind of some neat uh, numbers. On average, we were finding that most leks were around uh, about the 10 to 12 uh, bird range as far as males go. Uh, and it should be noted that we do count mostly just the males, just because the males are the ones who are always going to be there. Uh, the females are lucky. They get to kind of pick and choose which mornings they want to be there at the lek, uh, and they will jump between leks to kind of figure out uh, who's the best dancer. And so uh, our largest lek, which was pretty exciting, had over 30, uh, four, had 34 males and over 40 females. And so this was one of those leks that you could almost feel uh, more before you saw it or even heard it. Uh, just from them tramping down the ground. And so in total, uh, we were in the Southwest and we saw over 1,800 birds, which was awesome. Just kind of get and go out. Uh, in the Southwest, at least, they seem to be doing amazingly well, uh, especially in and around like the Great Sand Hills region. But one of the really weird things that we found, something that we weren't expecting, uh, was that when we visited a lot of these uh, kind of historical acts, the ones that the Ministry of Environment had already studied and kind of marked down as to where they were, uh, a lot of them weren't there anymore. Uh, we visited 92 of these historical lek locations and only 17 were still in their exact same spot. Uh, so this kind of gave us an average persistence of around 20%. Uh, some places had more, some places had less, but it was kind of weird that a lot of these leks have moved. Uh, in the end, we ended up finding uh, a lot more than 17 leks, so a lot of new leks were popping up. And it kind of speaks to the fact that sometimes these leks do move. Uh, which is weird. Sharp-tailed grouse uh, tend to sit in the same spot year between year between year between year. Uh, a lot of the ones that we were looking at in the Ministry of Environment database uh, had been there for like 60 plus years, and when we went there, they were gone. So obviously something is happening that is causing uh, sharp-tailed grouse just to kind of uh, pick up shop and move somewhere else. And so that is something that we're very interested in. And so just to kind of quickly describe this map, uh, all the blue dots are all the historical ones that we were uh, looking for, and all the yellow dots were the leks that I was able to find with my awesome field crew in uh, 2018. And so kind of more of a bigger picture now, uh, we kind of come to the question, where on earth do sharp-tailed grouse lek? And so what are the habitat requirements that they're looking for when they're picking a lek site? Is it the lek itself that's really important? Are they picking only for sharp uh, grass and hills? Or are they looking more for that proximity to their nesting habitat that they need, uh, the tall grasses and the shrubs? And so the way that I'm going about doing this is I'm creating what's known as a habitat suitability index, uh, which is basically a model which can rank uh, the probability of occurrence of a species within an area. And so what this actually give us is a really neat heat map uh, that kind of shows where the good spots are and where the less so good spots are. And so on this diagram, you can kind of see that the red spots are the optimal uh, sharp-tailed grouse habitats, at least for lacking purposes. And the uh, bluer areas are the ones that aren't necessarily as good. And so the way that this model was made is that we took all the leks from the 2018 field season, all the ones from the Ministry of Environment, and we put them over a whole bunch of different habitat features. So we're looking at things like uh, grassland percentages, we're looking at wetlands, croplands, uh, even Sorry, my headset decided to kill itself. Uh, but we were looking at different habitat features. We we're looking at uh, how they interact with that. And the main things that really popped out uh, from this model was that they were really picking for areas that have uh, grasslands around them. And so the way that this model worked is everything was broken down into one kilometer by one kilometer uh, pixel. And the areas that were used uh, for kind of making this uh, radius uh, graph is kind of shown in my little diagram there at the bottom. We would have our center pixel and we would then choose uh, and aggregate all the data from information around it. And so when I say within a two kilometer radius, we're actually making a five by five uh, kilometer square. And so what we're finding is that having grasslands within that area is really, really important. Uh, making sure that there is no cropland on the pixel itself of the lek is very important. And a very interesting one, uh, we did different things for topography in this model. And one of them was uh, the roughness. And what this meant is we looked at the average amount of uh, changes in topography on that pixel and areas that were more uh, 
flat actually ended up being uh, chosen for than the ones that had a lot more uh, topography. And the proportion of shrubs within that two kilometers is also very important. And so taking this together, it's right now still a work in progress, I should mention, but it seems that leks are very much uh, looking for uh, nesting habitat and good habitat around them when they're kind of picking those spots. And so I want to take us also on a bit of a trip uh, over here, we have the little town of Alsask, uh, right on the border between Alberta and Saskatchewan, as the name suggests. And I want to show you some of the data we have from the Ministry of Environment database. Now, this is uh, just looking at the uh, different counts from each year uh, for each individual lek, which is a bit confusing when you kind of look at all of them together. The thing I want you to look at right now, though, is at the very beginning, we have a very cyclical uh, pattern. And so sharp-tailed grouse, uh, at least here in the province, seem to be on about a three to four year cycle. Uh, and so every three to four years, they'll have like a very good year, then they'll kind of have a kind of intermediate year, then they'll have a bit of a crash, and they'll jump back and forth. And it's very interesting because you can look and see that most leks are following a very uh, consistent cycle. And it kind of brings us to the next question, you know, what is actually affecting that productivity between the year? And by productivity, we mean uh, how many birds are actually making it to adulthood and actually being able to kind of contribute to the lex. And so uh, traditionally, when we're looking at uh, population trends, we always would use the hunter harvest surveys, which actually mimic uh, lek counts very, very well, which is why they're being used. Uh, but then the big question is, you know, how can we predict this? And so we're looking at weather as one of the big predictors. We know that uh, most grouse and other birds, uh, they're really affected by uh, weather. And so at least uh, my hypothesis, we haven't gotten to this point just yet, is that uh, temperature and precipitation that affects them in the spring is going to be really, really important. And that's because uh, during the nesting season, uh, you know, you don't want it to be too, too hot or too wet. Uh, and then once the chicks are born, uh, they're at their most vulnerable uh, just when they're born. And so you don't want it to be too cold because uh, then they could get sick and die off. And so just being able to kind of know what things are important in the spring, we can then look into the future and be like, you know, it was a great spring last spring, which means that the sharp-tailed grass population is probably going to be increasing. So we might be able to maintain uh, a higher quota when hunting. And then looking more into the future, uh, this was actually a study done by Audubon back in 2014. And they looked at how the climatic uh, habitats for birds is going to change. So not necessarily the habitat itself, but just their preferred uh, temperature and precipitation regimes and how that's going to shift over time. And what this shows for sharp-tailed grouse is that uh, if climate change kind of continues the way that it is, then their population might start to shift further and further north. Uh, this, again, only talks about their actually preferred kind of temperatures and precipitations and nothing about the fact of how they're gonna actually be able to uh, stand those changes. They might just sit exactly where they are and adapt to having uh, warmer or colder climates depending on what happens around them. And so it is something though to kind of look at now before all these things happen because we are living in a time where sharp-tailed grouse are kind of still in their prime, still in the areas that they uh, traditionally were. And so understanding how they interact with the temperature and precipitation and other kind of climactic variables is important now before they've already changed. And so going back to our uh, Alsace graph, the next thing I want you to look at is at the very end, it's very interesting, a few of our leks just explode and kind of go up into having a ton of birds, whereas other ones just disappear. And so this kind of goes again back to my question, you know, why on earth do some of these leks disappear while others will sit in the landscape for over 60 years? And so uh, one of the things I hope to do uh, is to kind of go out and find these leks that have persisted, those who haven't, and using historical uh, or aerial photography and satellite imagery, uh, we're going to try to look around and see what's happened in and around those leks to see if anything's happened. Uh, as an example, this is one of the leks that has disappeared. Uh, and one thing that I noticed kind of going through a very quick Google search was that in 1998, this weird white dot appeared on the quarter section that the lek was supposed to be on. And then in the next year, it just explodes and becomes a lot bigger. Uh, when we actually went uh, surveying there last uh, spring, what we found is that it was a large gravel pit and it was uh, being excavated even in the spring, even in the morning. 
Uh, so obviously a lot of disturbance was happening on that quarter section. Um, the sharp tail grouse, they require having uh, the ability to kind of send out their calls to the females. And so they don't like the competition with all the tractors and bulldozers and such. And so they probably just moved somewhere else. And so bringing it all together, uh, having our tools and how on earth are we going to use them. So like, as I mentioned, the, uh, the HSI, their Habitat Suitability Index, it helps us to rank where in the province sharp tail lek uh, actually habitat is uh, and allows for more targeted uh, conservation of important habitats, as well as uh, outlining areas that maybe we want to go into and start to create habitat for sharp tail grouse. Uh, and understanding uh, lek persistence kind of only builds onto that and that allows for us to kind of understand the things that we need to do to maintain those areas so that leks stay there and don't just disappear after a few years. Uh, as well, uh, a neat kind of thing that you can do once you kind of know where all the good habitat is, uh, you can break it down into different areas and you can try to figure out the actual carrying capacity for those areas. So how many birds uh, could actually live in that habitat uh, sustainably? And so uh, one thing you can do is kind of figure that out. And then if you have a lot of suitable habitat, like in the Southwest, you're going to have probably higher uh, populations, which means uh, then you could set uh, better quotas for that area. Uh, you could then look maybe to the southeast where habitat is a little bit more lacking. And then you can start to figure out if you want to decrease quotas in that area instead. And so uh, the HSI is definitely the thing that we've done the most work on to date. But uh, once our population model starts to come in, it's going to be really useful, again, for helping to set quotas, because we're going to be able to look more into the future, uh, at least uh, a model that looks into the future that tells us maybe how sharp tail grouse are going to be doing. And so we'll be able to uh, predict if they're going to have a bad year, then we can preemptively uh, kind of reel things back a bit to help them uh, so that they spring back for the coming years. And so if any of this is interesting to you and you already want to help out, uh, there actually are some awesome ways that uh, you could help me. Uh, one of them being the Cooperative Wildlife Management Survey app. Uh, it's an app that you can get for your phone. And if you go out and you find a sharp tail grouse lek, uh, you can just push a few buttons on that. It'll ask you, you know, how many birds have you seen? It'll take a GPS coordinate of where you are, and that will then be put into a database, which I have access to. And it'll just help me to figure out, again, you know, where sharp tail grouse leks are and what kind of habitats they're using. Uh, secondly, uh, right now, the Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas is going on. Uh, and if you are doing that, I thank you so much. And if you are interested, I mean, there's workshops all the time going on. Uh, make sure you jump in on that, even if you only want to do it for one or two times. Uh, it's super useful, not only for sharp tail grouse, but for all birds here in the province. Uh, another neat tool that a lot of people use is eBird or iNaturalist. Uh, you can go out and just kind of record all the birds and uh, neat critters that you see. And I've been using that uh, just to kind of find new areas to go and look for birds uh, before I had my model. Uh, and it's just super useful. Uh, another kind of thing, if you are feeling particularly adventurous and you want to wake up super early in the morning, uh, you can always volunteer with me uh, to do some lex surveys. Uh, one of the things that uh, is kind of sad is that I'm only one person. I can't travel across the entire province in the spring with only two months really to be kind of doing lex surveys. So if you uh, feel like you want to get out and look for these guys, then, you know, send me an email. Uh, you can email me. Just I apologize again, my, my headset is not cooperating today. But you can email me at uh, brandonberta at gmail.com and I would love to help you guys uh, find areas to look for sharp-tailed grouse. And so with that, uh, I just wanna give a big thanks to all my sponsors, uh, without whom I would not be able to uh, go zipping around the province looking for these awesome birds. Uh, and also a big shout out to my field assistants uh, who had to put up with me for two months and my bad puns, uh, as well as my uh, my supervisors who have given me guidance through all this to kind of figure out how on earth to do science. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. That was really awesome. Um, to all of our listeners out there, please feel free to type any questions into the webinar dashboard. Um, I just want to let everyone know um, I crossed paths with Brandon this summer actually in Grasslands National Park and sure enough he was camera on hand um, like we learned in his bio um, and he was very passionate. It was him and his field crew were very passionate about the work that they've been doing in um, prairies, native prairie in, in southwest Saskatchewan. Um, Brandon, we were talking a little earlier about um, kind of how you got involved with this project. Could you tell our listeners kind of how, how you became passionate about about grouse? Yeah, for sure. So I guess uh, the project itself was kind of pre-designed before I came onto the scene uh, with the uh, new Upland Game Bird Management Plan kind of being in the works. Uh, there's a lot of questions that still remain. And so uh, the Ministry of Environment and the government was very interested in kind of just making sure that there was research being done on this, as well as SAS Power was very interested in where LEX were. And so it's kind of the perfect storm to uh, start doing research at that time. And so I applied and I got the job. And uh, the big thing that really drew me to it was uh, one, sharp tail grouse are awesome. It's like uh, being in like a nature documentary every day. Uh, you get to go up every morning, watch these birds dance and uh, it's just an awesome experience and I highly recommend it. Uh, if you haven't seen it and you're able, uh, mid-April to mid-May, get out there sometime before the sun rises and look around any sort of large pasture land and you'll find them. Uh, but the big thing that really drove me to it was that uh, this work isn't just for interest sake, is that it's something that is actually useful. And so if you do read the Upland Game Bird uh, Management Plan, you'll see the big questions that they have and how uh, my work is really feeding into that to make it into a, a better management plan so that we can kind of maintain the species here in the province so that uh, people will be able to hunt them and kind of enjoy them as I have uh, forever, hopefully. Thank you for that. Um, a listener named Dane, I would like to know if you have any tips to locate um, Lex and what to look for in the Lex. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the best time is probably mid-April to mid-May. Uh, you want to get there, uh, I would say, about an hour before sunrise. Uh, the best time that they really start dancing is about an hour, about uh, sunrise to about an hour after sunrise, I'd say, is kind of when you'll find the best numbers and the most activity. But if you're out looking for them, the way that we did it is we would drive around in our trucks and stop about every mile uh, and just turn off the truck and listen for a few minutes. Uh, when the males are trying to get the females to come, they'll call out and you can hear them about a kilometer off or so. And so the big thing you want to hear is, uh, it sounds a bit like a dog toy. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube. I highly recommend it. It's fun to watch. Uh, but they sound a bit like a dog toy. And then they have this rattle sound that they make when they're actually dancing. And so once you've heard that rattle, uh, you know you're close. And so the thing you want to be looking for is just uh, look for places that have uh, grassland and shrubs and uh, look for small rises, any sort of small hill that's probably where they'll be. And uh, one thing sometimes you can do is you can follow predators as well. They're very loud, so it attracts a lot of things to them. And so there's a few times I follow like a coyote uh, and we were able to find them, but uh, just follow your ears. They are very loud. And as long as you don't get too close, they will sit there and dance with you forever. Awesome, thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Dina would like to know, uh, or she says, thanks for the super interesting talk, and she would like to know if the ministry data is that from Habisat as well as their own surveys? So the surveys were done before Habisat and such, and so I know that it is, uh, it is used to have make their uh, their kind of layers that show where sharp tail grouse are, and so I think originally it was just done. Uh, out of interest and it became uh, a larger kind of thing that they were kind of maintaining to kind of be able to track where sharp tail grass are and how they're doing. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have an estimate of the population loss of sharp tails since the 70s? Uh, I don't actually have, I know they are on the decline. Uh, I don't have an estimation on the percentage or anything like that. Uh, but as far as like everywhere else in their range, they're actually doing probably better here than anywhere else uh, outside of like the boreal forest, of course, because we don't really have a lot of information there. Uh, but like the Colombian sharp-tailed grouse is doing horribly 
And in the very south and very southeast of the range, so more in the U.S., they're starting to decline as well really rapidly. And so, but yeah, sorry, I don't have a real, a real number that I can give you. No problem. Um, and a listener named Steve would like to know how much do natural predators affect population numbers? So they definitely can affect it uh, pretty drastically if there's like a big boom in uh, predators. Uh, the most successful time for uh, predators to really influence uh, the population sizes would be during the nesting season. Uh, females are kind of stuck sitting on their nests and uh, if they're scared off the nest, you can take out a whole bunch of eggs. And then uh, if it's early enough in the season, they can try to re-nest, but if it's too late, you know, you've lost uh, six plus birds coming into the population. And so um, the big thing that really gets them are actually uh, ground mammals. Uh, things like your skunks, raccoons, coyotes, uh, they're the ones who are going to come and take out the eggs. Uh, avian predators are more of an issue throughout the year. Um, and so I know like a ferruginous hawk would love to take out a, take out a sharp tail grouse when they're out on the lek or something like that. But typically it's the, the mammalian predators that are the real, real risk to their populations. Oh, interesting. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed that. Thank you. Um, a listener named Casey would like to know um, a little bit more about the predator prey cycle over three or four years. Do you know anything about that? So actually, interestingly enough, the sharp-tailed grouse uh, cycle is probably not a predator prey one. Uh, I know when most people see uh, cycles in nature, they think of the snowshoe hare and the Canadian lynx example. Uh, they're very specialized uh, kind of on each other. And so their populations kind of mimic each other as they kind of go up and down. Um, no one really knows why sharp-tailed grouse have a cycle, uh, especially because sharp-tailed grouse in the very southern parts of the range don't seem to have any sort of cycles at all, uh, and the ones up in the north seem to have even bigger cycles. And so right now, the only real uh, answer that anyone's kind of put forward is that it's somehow uh, latitude-based. Uh, and so the more northern you go, uh, the more cyclical their behavior becomes. And so it is something that I'm really interested in, and I'm hoping to maybe get a little bit of an answer when I start looking into uh, their populations and like weather and such. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Um, a listener named Andy would like to know what sort of numbers are on the hunting quota each year for Saskatchewan, and is it based on a percentage of the population estimate from previous years? So I'm not sure the numbers for this year. I believe uh, all that has been posted. But it, the numbers are based off of the hunter harvest surveys that are sent in every year from the hunters. And so they take an average of how many birds were taken, and then uh, that's per hunter. And as that kind of previous slide showed, let me bring that one up, uh, they're able to kind of figure out what they want to set the actual limits as. And so this is uh, the uh, diagram from the new Upland Game Bird Management Plan. And so highly recommend if people are interested in kind of figuring out how all that works to go check out that plan. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I haven't actually looked up this year's uh, actual thing. It's not in the management plan itself. It's a, a separate document. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got lots of questions here coming in, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of listeners that are wondering about um, if your study area is um, just in Saskatchewan or if you'll be in Alberta at all. So right now it's just in Saskatchewan. Um, there has been a lot of work in the southeast of Alberta. Uh, and I think right now the plan is just to stay in Saskatchewan. Uh, we only really have that two month period to do surveys and uh, Last spring was mostly in the southwest, and I'm hoping to expand into like the southeast as well this uh, this spring, at least with my field crew. And so, I mean, if I got information from Alberta, I'd happily try to use it and kind of incorporate everything. Uh, but this is uh, mostly targeted at Saskatchewan, just so it's useful for uh, working within Saskatchewan for setting uh, management uh, kind of criteria. Okay, thank you. Um, a listener named Rob uh, mentions that he's done quite a bit of uh, sharp-tailed grouse work in northern Alberta and found the tenants at left sites to be spotty, especially with a wide range of activity in, 
intensity over the locking season. Um, did you do any site revisits at the historic lights to verify occupancy? And did you randomize visits across the spatial extent? So yeah, we definitely went back and resurveyed all historical X multiple times uh, as much as possible. Uh, at a minimum, we went through every place twice and there was a bunch of times when uh, we would be kind of going back through it and maybe there was like one or two leks that were seen uh, the last time we went and we, then we'd find like five more new leks and like one would be like right on the road and uh, it's definitely sometimes a little bit of luck uh, as to when you're going to find them and so uh, and this the way that we originally did uh, the kind of choosing of areas wasn't so much randomized it was more uh, trying to go back through and hit up as many of these historical areas as possible uh, it definitely is my hope to do more uh, randomization for this field season uh, the reason we didn't do it last time is just because it is my first time even going out trying to find it. I want to get everything um, working properly. If you ask any master student uh, how their first field season goes, they'll always uh, tell you it did not go at all like they planned, uh, which is pretty normal. And so it is kind of one of those times for us to kind of get everything figured out for the next one. But yeah, thanks for the question. Awesome. Yeah, there's lots of really good questions here today. Um, there's quite a few people who are interested in kind of the connection between the disappearance of lacs and um, in relation to the disappearance of native grasslands or industrial um, activities popping up. Do you have any data comparing that? Uh, so I haven't done too, too much into that yet. Uh, just kind of anecdotally, uh, sharp-tailed grouse compared to say something like a sage grouse, uh, they're a lot more resilient to a lot of industrial things going on in their land. Uh, I saw sharp-tailed grouse dancing right next to oil platforms and things like that. And uh, there was one right next to a refinery that was like on. And so, or not necessarily a refinery, but uh, things were on, making lots of noise. And the sharp-tailed grouse were still there dancing. And, um, but yeah, I haven't really done too much yet into looking how that actually affects um, the persistence. But my main hypothesis behind it is that things are probably happening either to the lex site itself or something is taking out their uh, their nesting habitat nearby. Uh, sometimes I know people don't like shrubs in areas as it kind of reduces the amount of grass that's in an area. So they might be kind of pushing those out. And sometimes things are just being converted into cropland because it's more uh, economical at times. So and that can really kind of push them out of certain areas. Thank you. Um, a listener named Jana would like to know, um, you kind of showed the example of the gravel pit there where the left kind of disappeared. Um, was that because of the gravel pit itself or the amount of activity that would have led to the disappearance of the left? I would imagine it's the amount of activity. Uh, there is plenty of times, like I mentioned, where we found lex in weird spots that you wouldn't necessarily think that are pretty high human activity. Uh, I think just because it was active during the lecking time, uh, that's what really kind of messes them up. I think if they had started two hours after sunrise instead, then the birds would have been kind of leaving anyway, and they wouldn't necessarily have cared as much about that gravel pit being there, as long as the gravel pit hadn't actually been built on the lex site itself. Thank you. Um, with the historical lex that, um, that you had on the map there, a listener named Sarah would like to know, um, the ones that have disappeared, is it because they're in close relation to oil and gas developments or other disturbances? Like, have you done any analysis with, um, you know, with, like mapping analysis, I guess? So again, I haven't looked too much into the persistence itself, but I'm going to say uh, that oil and gas stuff has been used in the habitat suitability model, and it ranked very, very low as far as being an influence on sharp tailed grouse lex. Um, there is a lot of oil and gas stuff that's going on in the Great Sand Hills, and that's still probably one of the best places uh, in Saskatchewan to go and find sharp tailed grouse. And so I think the initial construction of oil and gas is a big disturbance, and it is something that's going to kind of push them out of an area. But after like a year or two of not being there kind of constantly working, I imagine they come back and they're totally fine with it. But yeah, I think one thing I should quickly mention too, uh, the persistence uh, that I got, about 20% or so, that is just of the ones that I was able to survey. Uh, it shouldn't be noted that, you know, I, we only surveyed those 90 something lex, that there's easily 
you know, 200, 300 historical X that we weren't able to hit uh, just because of time limits and accessibility reasons. And so I have kind of no idea how those ones are doing. And I imagine the more inaccessible ones are still doing perfectly fine. Interesting, thanks. Um, a listener named Aaron would like to know if, if any LECs are protected by regulation. So, I know for uh, like best management practices, at least for sharp tails, there is uh, a lot of things that people do to kind of maintain LEX. Uh, if you take out a LEC, then you're typically asked to do an offset of some sort, uh, just to kind of either purchase land or uh, remake the land in the area of the sharp tail grass might come back to be useful for them again. But sharp tail grass, as of themselves, uh, they are only really protected as a hunted species. Uh, they are uh, considered least concern uh, by the uh, IUCN, and so they don't really have a lot of uh, protections in that regard, outside of like the Colombian sharp tail grouse, which is endangered. Okay, thanks. Um, a listener named Stephen would like to know um, how the loss of crown land um, and PFRA pastures will affect the sharp tail grouse population. Have you looked at anything like that at all? Uh, so we definitely did do uh, a lot of our surveys were around the old PFRA pastures. Uh, a lot of them is just more or less shifted hands to other ranchers. And so as long as the land itself is still being used uh, for ranching and things like that, you're not converting it back over to uh, cropland. Uh, I think sharp tail grouse won't even notice anything's really happened. Uh, yeah, I think as long as People are kind of using the land sustainably. Nothing's really going to be affecting sharp tail grouse. They're a lot more bomb proof per se than uh, like the sage grouse were. And uh, but yeah, maintaining the shrubs is really the, the key to keeping them in an area. Okay, thanks. Um, along those same lines, um, a listener named Jake is interested in um, the encroachment of trees on, on kind of their habitat. Um, how do you think that impacts them? And have you done any work on that? So yeah, trees definitely have an impact on sharp-tailed grouse lex uh, in particular. Uh, what happens is uh, they've done a lot of research in, I believe, Manitoba and further south into like the U.S. And they find that if you have uh, some trees in the area, you know, they're kind of okay with that. They make really nice places for them to sun themselves uh, if it's really cold and things like that. But once you start having, um, I'm trying to remember the percentage now, it's not even all that much. But once you have too much trees in an area, uh, especially the more southern subspecies, so like the plains and the prairie, uh, will start to kind of abandon those areas. And so the more northern ones, uh, they're fine with trees. They live in the boreal forest. They kind of use muskegs mostly for their dancing sites. Uh, but yeah, trees do have an effect. And being able to kind of maintain some of those areas uh, is very useful for the sharp tails if they can kind of keep the trees back. Uh, from their lecking sites, at least. Great, thank you. Um, a listener named Bill would like to know why do sharp tail grouse like sandhill areas? That's a very good question. And so, kind of one of the fun things that I found when I first made my models, I had a lot of different um, geological things in it. So, like uh, sand and gravel and all these different things, kind of coming from my earth science background. And uh, sand dominated the model, it took over. Uh, and so, it was like, if there was sand, there was grouse. And I think it's kind of um, kind of one of those things that just because it's there doesn't mean it's uh, a direct relation to them. Uh, I think the reason that sand right now is kind of seen as the best place to go looking for sharp-tailed grouse is because it's not really great cropland. Uh, and so it is the places that have been left to become ranch land. And as such, it's kind of maintained more of that native grass uh, habitat. And so, but on top of that, I do think that uh, having trap dunes and things like that really produces those small little hills that sharp tails love. And it just kind of produces a very varied uh, landscape. And so uh, sharp tail grouse are vegetarians mostly. Uh, they do eat insects every once in a while, but once they reach adulthood, they mostly eat forbs and things like that. And so having a bunch of different uh, plants in an area is just a great way to uh, bring them in because they, they love all the different foods. Thank you. Um, 
A listener named Casey um, has a comment here that um, they witnessed their first active lack in the fall about a week ago and something that they'd heard rumors about. Do you hope to focus on fall activities at all? So I'm not looking at it that much. I know there are people who are doing research looking into uh, the fall leks. And so it's actually kind of interesting. What happens is uh, in the fall, and even sometimes even during the winter a little bit, uh, the males do return to their leks. And what they're kind of doing is uh, it gives opportunity for like their very young ones, the yearlings to kind of come in and practice their dancing skills, uh, just to kind of get into the groove of things and kind of figure out where they stand in the uh, hierarchy of the lek. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, if you were to remove uh, the middle bird from the lek, uh, it's not like a giant dog pile to figure out who gets to be the new top dog. Uh, instead, uh, they all just kind of know their spots and they'll all just rotate around uh, with the second place grouse becoming the new first place and so on and so forth. And so the fall is very important for that, uh, for them to kind of figure out where they lie within that kind of hierarchy. Uh, but as far as the actual numbers go, I don't think you'll necessarily always get as much of a consistent count as you would in the spring. And so, but there is research being done to look into that. And if it kind of pans out, it'd be awesome because it gives you two chances at counting uh, the populations in an area and kind of figuring out how many birds are there. Thank you. Um, along those lines, a listener named Dina would like to know, um, like would how the impact of disturbance in the fall, since it's not exactly their breeding season. So if there's a disturbance near a lack in the fall time, how would that impact uh, the males? Uh, so I don't know exactly. My my best guess is that it wouldn't affect them as much. Um, as long as it's not like a consistent thing where, say, you're going and constantly building on top of it, then they're going to move somewhere else. Uh, I do know that sometimes uh, in the winter they found that they will actually shift lex sites over just a little bit. Uh, because like they lose landmarks and things like that that they use to find the lek. And so if a disturbance is kind of minor, I don't think you really have anything to worry about as far as actually messing them up because, again, it's just them kind of practicing. It's not really the real deal. And so as long as nothing's happening in the spring, I would think they'd come back. Great, thanks. Um, a listener named Dan would like to know what weather parameters are you measuring during the spring and summer as it pertains to sharp tail grouse productivity? So uh, it's a very good question. It's something that I am still kind of looking into. Uh, the big things that we're going to be looking into are uh, temperature. And so particularly uh, if days kind of reach a certain threshold that might cause heat stress uh, in the birds. And uh, precipitation is another big one. Uh, Sharp-tailed grouse uh, are very reliant on carryover grasses. Uh, in the early spring, grass doesn't have a chance to grow. And so I also think that uh, having a good year of precipitation, uh, allowing for lots of gross growth of grass, especially at the end of the year uh, or growing season is very important because that grass is what they're going to be using to nest and to kind of dance in. And so precipitation temperature is probably the main things we're looking at. And then kind of looking them on like an annual basis, uh, monthly basis kind of idea and taking mostly just going to be taking averages and such and number of times. Uh, you get weird events like heat stress days or uh, like mini um, like flooding events and such. Great, thank you. Um, going back to the the fall lek dances, um, does that happen at any particular time of day? And is uh, that related to weather at all? I guess. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not as well read up on the fall lex as I am on the spring lex, uh, mostly because I haven't really been uh, going out to go find them. Uh, it interferes a bit more with my school and such, but I do think that they will typically be using them around the same times, uh, just because uh, the early morning is just a great time for most animals to be active. Uh, everything's a little bit more calm and it gives them the day to be able to go out and actually get food and such. Great, thank you. Um, and there's another listener that's wondering if you've considered building a spatial model that would predict um, the probability of lack abandonment. And um, their comment is that you need to see where there is existing suitable habitat um, that is most at risk for, for being abandoned. Yeah, it is something that I'm looking into. Um, 
it is a pretty big project with like the three main uh, kind of things that I'm looking at. And so the two ones that I really want to hit are the HSI and the population model. And so the like persistence is kind of uh, starting to get pushed back a little bit. And that is one of the things I've been looking into is that how can I incorporate that maybe more into the HSI because then I can use a more broad mapping technique instead of doing a very fine comb looking at all the pictures, which will take a really, really long time. Uh, but yeah, this is something that I'm very interested in, kind of uh, being able to kind of go and see if areas are more likely or not to lose their lex than gain lex. Thanks. Um, and a listener named Sarah here would, um, would like to know, would it be helpful for you to collaborate with oil and gas companies who are hiring environmental people to conduct lex surveys um, for, for them as part of their approval process? Like, could you work with them and get information about, um, about lex? Yeah, so a lot of that information is collected by the government. And as such, a lot of it then kind of trickles down into uh, my pockets to kind of be able to just kind of go out and look around. And so uh, a lot of their protocols are based off of uh, the protocols that are used by the Ministry of Environment. And so all their data works really, really well with mine as well. And so uh, it is something that uh, kind of indirectly is happening. Awesome. That's really great to hear. Um, a listener named Casey actually has the same question that I asked you before we began our webinar today. Um, what triggers the initiation of the breeding season in the spring? Is it hormones, the length of the day, the weather? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, I don't have the exact answer for this. Uh, I do think it is a timing thing, uh, probably something to do with the length of days, uh, just because the females, they have to nest uh, fairly early so that uh, they get their chicks going. Because uh, chicks, they need uh, insects and such to survive when they're very, very young. Uh, and so being able to time it for when the big booms for insects and such are is really, really important. And so uh, this last spring, uh, was super scary for me because when we started off going, like people were posting pictures of them dancing. Uh, and when we go out, uh, I didn't find any for like two, three weeks or so, just because of how like cold and windy everything was. And every time we saw a sharp tail, it was just up in a tree somewhere or something, uh, just sunning itself. Uh, but given time, they eventually just kind of kicked themselves into overload. Uh, because they only really have that short window to dance in. So sometimes they'll go a little bit longer, but we found that they started to pitter out uh, around the last few weeks of May, uh, kind of going into June, kind of as what we expected if, it, the, if the spring was normal. And so I definitely think it's more of a, them picking up on what season it is, be it through uh, the daylight uh, times and things like that. Uh, but yeah, once they're going, they're going. We saw them dancing in a blizzard at one point. Uh, just because, you know, time is a, a factor for them. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, looks like we have one more comment here from a listener named, named Dina, and it just says, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, it looks like that's all the questions we have. So thank you so much, for Brandon, for taking the time and sharing your, your passion and your knowledge and your enthusiasm. And yeah, this was really amazing. I learned so much more about sharp tail grouse than I, than I could have imagined. So thank you very much for, for this awesome presentation today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for everyone who came out. I apologize for uh, my headset having a few issues. Uh, I don't think it uh, liked being quiet uh, with no uh, audio coming into it. But uh, thank you so much for those who stuck around. And thank you for your questions. I hope you guys uh, found it interesting. And I hope you guys go out and find your own sharp tail grouse lex and get to enjoy it. Yeah, I'm curious about the fall ones. And it's a beautiful, um, sunny day where I'm at. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to go and look for some fall sharp tails. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, I want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in today, uh, for catching our webinar. Um, when you leave the session, there'll be a quick one minute survey that'll pop up. If you don't mind taking a minute to fill that out, that'll help us keep our funding for um, to continue our Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars into the future. So with that, thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and happy Thursday. Bye.